Welcome to another installment in Clock Tower. It's Pastor Chris Byers of St. John's Lutheran Church in beautiful Jill, Wisconsin. And glad to have you here as we continue on. Uh, we are on Unit A2, Lesson 2 of the uh, uh, Seed Bible Study through Sola Publishing House. Uh, you can find them on solapublishing.org if you want to look them up on there. Uh, or solapublishing.com. Uh, David fights to Goliath is uh, today's uh, topic that we're looking at. Uh, I'm gonna now. You do have the worksheet available for you here. Um, now I'm going to switch to uh, move us onto the screen here. We're going to go to the worksheet there. That way we can follow along on what's there here, and uh, we can uh, follow along with the worksheet as we start out. We're going to open up here uh, right at the beginning there with the prayer that's right at the top. Let us pray together. Almighty King and Lord, you are the source of all courage. We give you thanks for giving us victory by your power over impossible situations. When life presents challenges that seem insurmountable, help us to recall your goodness and strength and to trust in your protection. In the name of our Savior, Christ, we pray. Amen. The introduction goes on to say, In the days of the monarchy, among the chief rivals of Israel were the Philistines. These sea people had gained a foothold on the coast and were attempting to overcome the army of King Saul. When no one would fight the giant Philistine champion Goliath, named Goliath, young David stepped forth in faith. So we're going to open up, uh, and I'm going to open up my Logos, but if you have your Bibles available, um, please uh, feel free to open up into... Uh, uh, your own Bible there to follow along. Otherwise, you can follow along with me on uh, on the screen as always. So uh, we will we will start out with that chapter, and here we go. Uh, we are now on First Samuel seventeen verses one through forty nine. <clears throat> now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered together at Soco which belongs to Judah, and, camp, and camped between Soko and Azekah, in Ephes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up a line, in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of, Phil, of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the, his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron. And his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And Saul and all Israel 
heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. And Jesse said to David his son, Take your, for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the, to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning, and left the sheep with a keeper, and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he camped to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said, to the men who stood by him. What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way. So it shall be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down, and with whom have you left the, those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see that battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another, and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, They repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in hand and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came to David with his shield bearer in front of him. 
And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in his appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to, Philistine, to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of, Phil of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into, the, into our hand. When, da when, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine, and David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it. And struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. All right. Well, that was a long reading, that's for sure. So we, we have an idea, everything going on. This is a lot that's going on, but most of us are familiar with this uh, with this portion of scripture. Most of us are familiar with the uh, David and Goliath uh, uh, to some extent, uh, where he faces the mighty giant speaks out and does and defeats them. Uh, one thing I'll say is what strikes out to you here, some of the things that were brought up in class today, uh, was should not back down when telling others about God, but trust in him. Eliab sounds jealous, his brother sounds jealous, and David not sent by God's David is sent by God's strength, not his own strength. So one thing David he doesn't take any of this on his own. He's all making it for making these statements in the boldness and the bold name of God. He's not acting as if, as if this is something that he's able to do by his own power, or his own might. He's being very direct on this here too. He's not afraid. Uh, now, you know, with his, the thing is, is it kind of tells you a little bit here if you think about this. It just kind of came into my mind is you think about the promise that was made by, uh, by or the boast or the gamble that was made by, by Goliath. Send me your champion, and uh, if I if he beats me and kills me, I'll you we we will now you'll be under your subjection. We won't we won't bother you anymore. Um, but if my if I kill your champion, you're our slaves, and you won't give us any trouble anymore. Now I dare bet had the Philistines won had had, had Goliath won this battle had it not happened as it had. Uh, the Philistines would have been like, hey, you ma we made this deal. You sent your champion. We won. Now you are our slaves. You understand that. Uh, unfortunately, though, <laughs> we know that uh, even though they, though they lost, uh, the, not like the, it's not like the Philistines just stopped creating trouble, right? Uh, they didn't leave Israel alone after this, did they? Uh, no, they were still a problem. Uh, it kind of tells you how the legion, the Satan, gives us lies, offering us ways of uh, saying, hey, take me on. If you win, hey, I'll leave you alone. You lose, you, you fall to me. Um, never fall for Satan's lies. That's a big, uh, big no-no there. Uh, the next thing here, let's, uh, let's let me look back at the screen here. I'm going to go back over and uh, uh, let's look here. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to look at, uh, we're going to go through this worksheet here. Uh, as we continue on in the process. So um, we already read, got those. What's, what are some of those impressions? Some good impressions there. Uh, the books of 1 and 2 Samuel are 1st and 2nd Samuel. Both is correct. And the books of 1 and 2 Kings are 1st and 2nd Kings. Tell the story of Israel as a united nation and the subsequent division into North and South Kingdoms, part of the biblical books of history. Some of this same content is repeated in First and Second Chronicles, or One and Two Chronicles, in a shorter form. For the nation of Israel, the time of the monarchy was a high point. One king ruled over a united land. The first king was Saul, a troubled leader who later turned away from God. 
the Lord raised up David, king, our King David, to take Saul's place. David and Saul struggled against one another until the death of Saul. When David ascended to the throne, David ruled for many years and was succeeded by his son King Solomon, who built this, who built the temple of in Jerusalem. So we remember all of what's going on here. The next part here is what Philistine town was Goliath from? Were the Philistines original inhabitants of their, this area, or were they invaders? Well, Goliath is from Gath, and these are the Sea People. Um, they're, they came from the, across the Mediterranean, somewhere north uh, in Europe. Uh, no, not certain exactly where they're from, uh, originally on there. Um, uh, but they are Sea People. Uh, they came in uh, and invaded the, the coast. They were uh, a peoples that were looking for more land and opportunities. And they saw, they saw this area, this little strip of land, Especially if you have to, if you remember, if you want to remind, remember on this, is that that time, this time, um, Israel wasn't a bad, wasn't just a desert. Um, you know, one thing if you study, if you're, if you're a student of history uh, and all that, um, you're going to remember uh, Israel was the promised land, uh, milk and honey. It was beautiful, lush. Uh, at the times when Israel entered into it, it was beautiful and lush. There were trees, there were vineyards, there were uh, grapevines. There was all of that that was available for the people of Israel. So this was not some terrible desert area. Uh, and it's gone through periods of drought and things. In fact, uh, one thing if you want to look at some interesting history. Uh, in, the, uh, early, uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, there were Israel, Israelites that were going back uh, into uh, Palestine, it was called at that time, um, which Palestine is the name that was given to the Israel by its conquerors, by, by those that was always a territory, uh, and the territory was Palestine. So first the Greeks, then the Romans, and then everybody following. Uh, the Romans are the first to give it the name Palestine. Um, Palestine and the Palestine, uh, Palestine was a was a uh, occupied nation. It was never its own nation state. Um, so, in all reality, Palestinians are just uh, uh, were various ethnic groups or people groups of mainly Arab groups and Bedouins and and that like and the like out there. There's various Semitic groups, uh, as well as some that came like I'm sure there's. Uh, some Philistines that are still integrated in that area, um, but it, it you know it wasn't ever really a, a people group in and of itself, up until after World War II and the territory was uh, turned to Israel, and then all of a sudden there was a whole fight for the nation of Palestine, um, but <laughs> Palestine was never its own nation, uh, unlike some Palestinians would like people to think. Uh, but anyway, um, we move on with that there. Uh, but Gath was where he was from, and uh, they were definitely invaders. They were the Sea People. They weren't Semitic, Semitic people. They were from a whole different area uh, at that time. So let me uh, go back there. And the second question says, Ancient manuscripts of the Bible put Goliath's height somewhere between 6 foot 6 and nine foot eleven. How would you feel going out to fight such a large man? And what did uh, David's brothers think? Um, you know, one thing about that, and I, I will say the problem with that question in some manuscripts out there, um, some of the interpreters, uh, it says in our in, in, in the scriptures, or it does say that he was six cubits and a span. Uh, one cubit is about eighteen inches in length. So there is some variation. It all depends on which cubit they were using as a, as a measurement. Uh, and then a span would be about half of that. So you're looking at about 18 inches uh, for a cubit, and then the span would be 9 inches. So 6 times 18 plus 9 is basically what we're going. So that's a lot more than 6 foot 6, right? Because you're looking at 6 foot... You're looking at nine foot nine inches would be about the proximate height if we're looking at uh, the standard cubit or the imperial cubit of 18 inches and a span of nine. Span would be half a cubit. 
So, uh, you know, it could be over. Um, six foot six would be, uh, would be short by using that measurement uh, tool, uh, using that, th those measurements on there. Um, I would say, yeah, he was probably well over nine feet tall. Uh, and he, uh, he was well over eight feet tall at minimum. Um, he was a very tall man. He would, have out, he would have been taller than many of our modern basketball players. So just imagine walking in on this giant. He is truly a giant, and he's strong. He is not lanky in any way, shape, or form. You think about how heavy just his armor, his spear, he probably was the type that they would, he would picked up boulders and would throw them uh, if you know, I talked about in class, you know, you think about the Highland games and stuff like that where you have the, the, the rock tosses where they don't pick up little rocks and throw. They pick up boulders and throw. Uh, and you can imagine how wide and how long his arm span would have been, what size of a, he could have gotten his hands around to pick up. Uh, and he probably would pick up some large rocks, boulders, what we'd probably call boulders, uh, that beam, that weaver's beam that he had, I mean, it's like he had a tree for his spear with a strong metal tip. Uh, his sword, just uh, can't imagine how long his sword was. And the shield bearer probably had a good-sized shield. Now, I'm sure he was very thankful that David was a good shot with the sling because uh, he didn't have to sit there and take the brunt of the, of, of the damage to protect, uh, to protect Goliath, uh, though there was probably some fear uh, that there would be repercussions for his failure to protect him. But uh, we do know that, uh, you know, that, uh, that Goliath was a very large man. Uh, and just imagine going out and seeing this. I mean, David was not a large. He was smaller than his brother. So he, you know, he was probably in his, uh, he might have been, let's say, five foot eight. Um, uh, you know, is probably, I guess, some of the numbers I've heard in the past. I, we don't know really exactly how tall he was. But he wouldn't have been, comparatively, he would have been a lot smaller. Uh, and then, so, and then the brothers, they were definitely afraid of him, uh, of Goliath, because they weren't willing to stand up. And they weren't very happy about David stepping in. Uh, so when we look at this, we, we can definitely get some good insight as to what, what sort of issues are going on. Explaining his courage to King Saul, what did David say about his previous battle experience, and how does our remembrance of God's help in the past give us courage for present times? Well, David reminded him really quickly when he was talking to Saul. He kept really straight. He said, you know, I, I'm, I'm a shepherd. I've been out in the field. I have protected the sheep from lions and bears, and I have gone after and attacked lions and attacked bears to save my sheep, my flock. I wouldn't let them go. I'm very strong in that. F giving us a foresight of what, uh, what would come through our, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Uh, and really, you know, fighting these things, he, had, he, he didn't have any real battle in the sense of fighting other men, but he had battled some very strong, powerful creatures. Uh, so, so there was some for them. And also he realized and he trusted in God and what God would offer and God would provide. Uh, and he was very, very faithful in that. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those I, I shared in class, you know, one of the things, the greatest blessings that I, I received in entering into the process to go through uh, candidacy uh, and be a pastor was I was, I was forced to actually um, go through and write my own uh, testimony of faith as I would write and talk about the various things that led to my faith uh, and, and my, my uh, turning to Christ and led me to want to become a pastor. They really, that was the central part. And having to look back and see where people had truly influenced me uh, in my in my faith and in my life and in my thinking, uh, it was it was great in the sense that I was able to really um, really look back and see where God was truly at work, even at times when I didn't realize God was working. You know, that, and and that happens probably. I can't believe I'm one of the few that uh, can say. Uh, 
you know, uh, can point to where God had really changed my life. Um, I think he changes most lives, right, out there. I mean, when we are honest about it, we can and really look back, we can see where God is truly influenced. And it's an important thing. I would say it's good for Christians to do that periodically for themselves uh, and just kind of look and see where God has been at work in each and, each and every one of our lives. When God and really what's leading us in our path and how we can be strengthened in our faith, knowing that God has never, ever, 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 ever forgotten us, and he never will. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, so we can always stand firm in those promises. And it just gives me courage all the time when I think about what it is that God is doing and what it is that God has done. Uh, so here, let me go here, back here. Let's look again at the worksheet as we continue to work through this. In that battle, in the battle, what weapons did David have and what weapons did Goliath have? Seeing David, what did Goliath say? So the fourth question there. And that's a, and that's a good, good, good question to think about. So what battle weapons did David have? He had a staff, he had a sling, and he had five stones. Um, one of the things discussed on there is that, um, you know, because uh, Goliath, uh, Goliath had, uh, he had his weaver's beam, he had his sword, he had a shield bearer, he was wearing a helmet, wearing armor. Uh, he, he, was, he, was, uh, he was protected to the T, he was armed to the teeth. And uh, he, he was really ready for war. David, not so much if you look at him on an outsider of his appearance. Had, had Goliath gotten with him with his sword? Or thrown his, or a Goliath thrown his spirit, David, David uh, would would if it had had the target, which I'm sure that Goliath was very good, and David didn't get out of the way in time, uh, or if his aim was even better, uh, David probably you know there's there was really little hope for David in this whole process, but, and I'm going to say this. Goliath's pride got to him, right? Goliath looked at him and said, What am I, a dog that you're coming after with these sticks? Um, so, I mean, I'm sure Goliath saw the staff uh, and the sling. Um, and this was something that was discussed. The sling actually may have also uh, been one where uh, it wouldn't have been like the normal slingshot, um, but it would have been uh, one they, they, they gripped, but it might have been even more of that where it was on a stick to give a lot more power, and if David is used to using that, it was a very, very uh, powerful weapon. And uh, in fact, it was shared how there's a uh, Fowler's, uh, there's a YouTube uh, channel on there that they show. Uh, they did a test to see what would happen, and one actually got pretty accurate where he could use the, the sling on a stick with a smooth stone, uh, to show how powerful that would be through ballistics gel and a coconut, and it, it's pretty destructive. Um, so to give an idea of how, why, I mean, it was very effective, as we know, because, uh, you know, it took, it took Goliath's life, um, uh, and uh, David was very accurate with it. So um, that, that's one thing we could look at in there. Uh, but Goliath, his pride got in his own way. Um, he wasn't expecting anything uh, from this little upstart little guy without any armor, without a sword, without a shield bear. Uh, he, I mean, he was just wearing what he normally wore. Um, and his kind of thinking on this is, uh, you know, um, he was forced to, David, they tried to cover him with more than he needed, putting all this stuff on him. And David was realizing, I can. It kind of made me think as we were talking about uh, Judges and Gideon when he had all his men. He had 30,000, then brought it down to 10,000. God said, said, said it was too many, um, so brought him to a uh, water. And basically those who would scoop up with their hands and lap like a dog, so the warrior dogs that are do uh, you know, the dog warriors, uh, are the ones that were picked um, basically, to show God's glory, um, you know, the thing is, is everybody, he wanted everybody to, uh, you know, everybody was thinking conventionally, we need to send you out armed and protected, um, but see, D 
David was going out in faith. He was going out in faith, thinking, knowing that God, with, with great certainty, that God was going to protect him because this man, this Philistine, was dishonoring God. So he went out fully in faith uh, and was ready, uh, even though Goliath was not. Um, so, have you ever been insulted and made fun of? How does that feel? Why is it important to remember that it's God who gives us our true identity, not the things other people say? And this is a real important one. Everybody agree. I mean, everybody in our group has been insulted. I'm sure that if you're listening out there, you're going, almost oh, certainly, I've been insulted a lot of times. And, you know, when we... Uh, it doesn't feel good. Nobody likes to be insulted. Sometimes we stand up and sometimes we, we get a little more up in arms than we probably should when we are insulted. Um, but it, you know, remembering that, it, you know, we, sometimes it's too easy to be insulted. We need to not be insulted easily. Uh, because when we're insulted far too easily, what happens is it harms not only us further, um, it empowers someone else above us. Um, insult is a choice. To feel insulted, to feel offended, that is a choice that we make. Uh, and, it's, and it's something that really, um, as followers of Christ, it's better for us to act less on our insult or what, when we feel insult, that we're being insulted. But to stand firm, now when people attack God or insult God, that's something different. As followers of God, we should say, hey, hey, hey wait a minute, um, keep it focused on me, buddy, uh, but don't, don't you dare say anything about my God. Uh, and I mean, because that's showing an arrogance and that sometimes uh, gets in the way of us. I mean, like it did with, uh, like it did with, with, with Goliath, his arrogance is what caused him, cost him his life. But so, uh, and how often does that happen? People that oppose God um, often don't think about those things. Uh, they, they, they think they're above it all. Um, and we as Christians, we can be a good reminder saying, I would be careful about doing that. Uh, and standing firm in the Word of God, uh, not being afraid of what others may think of us. And continually, continually keeping our spirit moving forward. All right, so here, let's, uh, let me look at the next one here. According to verse 47, what did David trust in and whose power did David count on? What basis did David hope for this confidence? And how do we also have access to this power and confidence? So when we think about what David was counting on, is he was counting on the on God, the, the Lord of the angel, or the armies of the angels of God. He was he, there's the host of heaven that he was counting on to help protect him and guide him. And we could be honest and say, I'm sure that it was the host of heaven that helped guide that stone into Goliath's forehead. Um, that was also part of what was being done. But he had his full confidence in God, not afraid of what was going to happen to him, because one, he trusted in God, and two, he trusted in the promise of God. He trusted fully that God was going to protect him. And, and if he died in, in honoring God to him, it was a worthwhile, it was a worthwhile bet, right? I'm gonna. I'll die with God's honoring God. Why? What? What is to me if I do die? Right? Um, if I die honoring God, then praise God. Let let His blessings flow. Um, so uh, that that is an important aspect of who we are. So what I'm gonna do here? Let's go to the next question here uh, on there. And I know I'm gonna have to turn it quickly here to my logos. So. Uh, but it says, read 1 John 4, verses 4 through 6. So if you open your Bible up to 1 John 4, verses 4 through 6, you can follow along, uh, and uh, or you can just read along with me here. And I will put it up on my Logos screen, so that way you'll be able to see it fully. Uh, and it says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world. And the world listens to them. 
We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. All right. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So when we think of these things, what is it? Here it goes in this context. When John speaks of the world, and I'll put that up there for you. When John speaks of the world, what is he referring to? What way is the world opposed to God? Now some might, we can almost laugh at this here. We know that the world is very strongly uh, showing its light against God. Always has, actually. Uh, has since the fall. Uh, and uh, he's speaking to the worldly ways, the, the things, the sin, Satan, all of his lies. And uh, the world is opposed to God because it's only, it wants to stand up on its own righteousness, uh, believing that it is righteous in and of itself. And that's the greatest issue we have to be careful of as followers of the one true God, is making sure that we are faithful and humble in the Spirit, so that what we know and what we believe, what we say, it doesn't have any power or merit in this world. But we seek out to be uh, the glorious, uh, we seek out to, God's glory is the ultimate first thing in our lives. We put it number one. So uh, we, we're, never, we're, we're never too reliant upon the things of this world, but we're always reliant upon God. And the final question we have today says, why is it important to know that as people of faith we are from God, and in what sense have we already overcome the world because of what Jesus has done for us? And what does this say about our futures? So when we think about what it says about our futures and what God has done and everything of that nature, uh, you know, we as a people of faith know that we're from God because we know God's promises. We know his way. We know the ways of the world. And we know that we have overcome the world because our Lord has told us he has overcome the world. And because he has overcome the world, we belonging to him have also overcome our world. And we don't have to be afraid because God is always with us. God walks along with us through everything. He knows our needs. He knows our worries. He knows our cares. He knows the suffering. And there is nothing that can ever separate us from that. And that, is the, and that was the lesson for today here. And we had some great talks that went through this. It's a good lesson, a good reminder. Also, I want you to make sure you leave our, uh, our, tech, uh, our tech guy, uh, Dan. Uh, Dan Wright, his uh, shoulder, is, uh, he's got major pain. It was actually debilitating for him today. Uh, so he wasn't able to be there. So I apologize for those of you uh, that were looking for our worship service this day. Tried to get it up, but I'm sorry. Uh, uh, our tech guy was out and uh, the people I scrambled together to be able to do it weren't uh, fully aware. And neither was I as far as how everything works with our uh, tech upstairs. We will make sure that things are different in the future so we don't get caught with that ever again. But unfortunately, that, uh, that, was, uh, that was the case, and I apologize for that. Um, much of the message today was centered around very similar to what we read here, though the texts were different. But realizing that God is the one who gives us hope, he gives us promise, and when we place our faith within him and with him, uh, he never fails us, and that is one of the most important aspects of who we are as followers of Christ, remembering always who it is that we belong to. Now, I want you to know and I want you to remember that all things are done to his glory and to his honor and to his praise. And I pray that you just have yourself a wonderful rest of your day. I hope you enjoyed this. Make sure if you have any comments or questions, just put them in the there. I do try to respond to them when I notice if there's a question uh, or something that needs to be addressed. I will, uh, I will respond to that or review that. Uh, but uh, glad, or, or sometimes even in the discussion, you can always have some discussion on various points and see what, uh, what other thoughts may come up with that. But I do, I'm so glad to have you join us. Remember always that Jesus loves you and so do I. Have yourself a good rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you uh, later on throughout the week. God bless. Mm -hmm.